Our next testimony comes all the way from Belgium and currently leads a global team in his job of sales engineers, in bio, pharmaceutical, industry something, I'm not sure, <laughs> way above my pay grade. He's been a Christian since 2015 and he met his wife there uh, at that time when uh, he became a Christian and uh, they have two children again together, Emmanuel and Gabriel. Um, he believes without a shadow of a doubt that God led him to intercessor in the summer of 2021 when he discovered our service online. Um, he and his wife have made intercessor their home, and they have faithfully served in our community groups and sit on the executive team for that and are serving on the weekend as well. Would you give a warm welcome to Flores D. Sinet? Happy Good Friday, everyone. As Father Brett said, my name is Flores, and I will not be upset with anyone if you forget my name. <laughs> it's not a common name. It is a Belgian name. Um, I get the question often, how do you spell it? So the way you spell it is F-L-O-R-I-S. What it means, it's actually, it has a, its roots in Latin. It means flower. So, the interest, the in, the <laughs> I know, what's even more funny is that my in-laws actually call me Flower. <laughs> so, I was born and raised in Belgium. I was born in a loving, hard-working, middle-class family. Um, and I was blessed to have a Roman Catholic upbringing. But while growing up, very quickly, my, Catholics, my Catholic roots were outgrown by a desire to fit in and to outperform those around me. I always had really good friends, uh, was blessed with, you know, always a handful of really close good friends, but I was never part of the cool gang, the cool kids, and that kind of bothered me. I had to drive to overcompensate and prove them wrong and to do better than anyone else in whatever it is that they were doing. <laughs> so my first God was called recognition. I got to university and I was discovering that God, well, not God, but I was discovering that I was blessed with a powerful brain. I was able to get two degrees, and I had good grades, but I also was partying, partying harder than anyone else. <laughs> and I was really, really proud that I was able to show them how it's done. <laughs> <laughs> so during these years, I also discovered a very clear view of what I wanted to do with my life. I was going to be more successful than anyone else. So the sky was the limit. Was the limit. And I was going to be successful no matter what. And my god of recognition became a god of ambition. Briefly after university, I then also felt very accomplished already that I had landed a very well-paying first job. And I happened to receive a lot of praise from my colleagues at that time for my initial work product. I was recognized, and uh, very quickly I got the chance to take on an international assignment. The company sent me to the United States on an international assignment, and at that time was also a rather big jump, a nice promotion, um, given my age and my relative junior tenure within the company. Nonetheless, I found it to be rather fitting and appropriate and also timely. In 2010, it was that I moved to the United States and the company sent me to New York City. And it was a lot of fun. I was uh, living in Queens, not in the city, but, but you know, I was living close enough to the city to really have a good time as a 27-year-old. <laughs> so it was the time of my life, I thought at that time. I had no, no obligations. I had a good amount of disposable income, and I was on a career track way ahead of my peers. I felt great. I thought I had made it ahead of anyone else, and I was thinking that I had a really good life set out for myself. That's it. I'm on, I'm on track. However, as we know, with anything new, there's a honeymoon phase. So that honeymoon phase lasted about two years. Um, but then things started to get a little bit rough. It started to get a little bit difficult at work. So I started to notice that it's not that easy to work with people. So, <laughs> you know, I started to get that you don't do things by yourself, but you have to get people on board, and, you know, it's not that, not that easy. So I was getting a little frustrated. Um, it seems that the people around me were not able to keep up with me. Uh, it seems that they were also slow, slowing me down a little bit. And, you know, my love of self and my god of recognition and ambition, they got a little bit upset. Also a little bit confused. Didn't really know what, what was going on there. Then in 2014, 
Um, I met an interesting young lady. Her name is Gwen, and she's sitting right there. <laughs> and what I, what I saw there was quite refreshing. I saw somebody that was really genuinely interested in me. She was asking a lot of questions about me, about my profession, and she seemed to be really, she seemed to really care about, you know, what, I, what I'm all about and what I'm doing. I found that really inspirational. I also saw a beautiful smile, a loving and caring person, and a wonderful personality that came with a strength and a compassion that I had never seen in anyone else before. So I was intrigued. But also she asked me the, the very strange question. She asked me if I would go to church with her. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I found it a little odd. This day and age I was thinking, we go to church still, okay. <laughs> But I said, I go to church with my parents every now and then. I can go to church with you. <laughs> so I also discovered that church, you know, in the U.S. was very different from the church that I was used to in, back in Belgium. Church was not an old-fashioned building that was half empty. It was actually a high school gym that was being transformed into uh, an auditorium one day out of the week that was packed with people and a preacher that was standing on stage wearing jeans and actually talking for 45 minutes about something that was relatable and something that I actually could apply in my life. So I was intrigued. I said, hmm, interesting. But, you know, that's where I left it. But then, you know, Gwen and I were dating. Things got a little bit more serious, and I started to realize that she was the girl that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. And this was great, but I also started to develop a very other feeling inside of an, an uncomfortable feeling. I couldn't really put a finger on it, but it, it wasn't a good feeling. And at that time also, the challenges that were continued. There was actually a reorganization and there was an emotion for me. So there was a, a season that, that started that was one of a lot of soul searching. That feeling inside me told me that something was off. I had to wrestle through it and it was painful. I never quite understood how somebody can be depressed without a reason, but I guess I was getting to that stage. What I could discern was anxiety and panic. Not really sure why, but as I wrestled through it, I kind of realized that I had had a good life, but I hadn't really built up much. I saw a life full of responsibilities coming my way, and I wasn't really sure how I was going to do it. How was I going to be a good husband? How was I going to be a good father? How I was going to continue to be successful at work? Because apparently it's not working right now. How was, how was I going to provide? Who was I? What's my identity? So a very shallow basis for very difficult questions and a lot of responsibility that came my way. So I had no idea how to do it, but I know that something had to change. And I know also that I saw in Gwen somebody that was very strong and always very positive. And I knew it had to do with her fate. So I said, whatever I need, it's that. So I decided one evening to pick up a Bible and to start reading it. And I was amazed from the very first few lines that I read. I always dismissed the Bible as a book that was thousands of years old that had no relevance to today anymore, and the words just leaped off the pages for me. I said, society hasn't changed, and what I see in those people, I see in myself. Sinful and broken and, you know, not seeing the best thing that's in front of you when it's standing right in front of you. So I started reading it and continued reading it. It blew my mind. So I wanted more. We started going to church. Uh, we were uh, attending a church in Queens, the Rock Church. Um, and quickly after that, I gave my life to Christ. We went to... <laughs> Praise God. We went to church multiple times a week. We studied, we served, we fellowshiped, and we grew together, Gwen and I. It was the beginning of an amazing ride. Um, we, we even joined the cell group, or I joined the cell group, and even engaged in street evangelism. So I realized that I had become this guy standing on the street corner that I always looked at and said, what are you doing? <laughs> so I poured a lot of strength out of God's, God's word. I learned a lot about God by reading his word, and I learned a lot about myself. I learned about what it means to lead. I learned about what it means to work with people. I learned about what it means to be a good husband, about one, being one flesh with my wife. I got introduced to his promises. Um, he lit a fire for his word and he gave me a passion for the supernatural power that sits in his reality. And as we journeyed together, Gwen and I, blessings followed. We were seeking and discerning his well. We got married. I got raises and promotions. We got pregnant uh, our first, of our first son, and we ultimately were sent to China 
um, on the adventure of a lifetime. Still today, as we live out our life in Christ, the one promise that we really stand by is that we will find him when we seek him with all our heart. And at every turn, he has been there. He has been moving in our life and opening doors where they needed to be opened, and they have been closing doors where they needed to be closed. And we've seen it multiple times. It's really touching. It's also the promise that God is to you guys, to Intercessor Church. We are so blessed to be part of this church family now, a little under two years ago. I believe it's supernatural how Gwen and I, as individuals and as a family, have grown in our walk since entering the church. So I would like to thank Father Brett, the clergy, and all of you for your warm welcome and for your leadership. So, 40 days of breakthrough. 40 days is a long time. We've done little stents of fasting, Gwen and I, when we were looking for God's guidance or looking for specific breakthroughs, but not, never quite six weeks. Um, Gwen has done six weeks of fasting, and the best thing that I did was to stand, stand on the sideline and cheer her on. <laughs> <laughs> but when Father Brett said that we would be fasting for 40 days, um, and we would do it together as a church, I was intrigued and excited, and I said, okay, I'm doing it as well. So. Six weeks of fasting is quite something, but it doesn't cease to amaze me how clear God's word and his will becomes when we do so and how close we can feel to God. The breakthrough prayer that I was praying for was, Come Holy Spirit, give me your power to share, his word, to share your word with those around me. I think that God has given me a variety of gifts, but I know for sure that one is not the gift that I have, and it's direct evangelism. And it frustrates me, because I know that we have to share his word, and I want to share his word, but I get stuck in the execution. So I feel I need power um, to do so. And very early in the 40 days, God spoke, and I believe that God spoke, saying that, that it's not just about power. It's also about people, and it's about opportunities. These three have to come together. And over the past 40 days, he has been illuminating those elements quite vividly, as I was reading, praying, hearing words from people spoken in my family or spoken in the church as I was reading books, listening to podcasts, um, discussing things with my cell group, um, and so on. So I took an extensive journal. I'm not going to go through 50 pages of writings with you guys, but I'm going to just share <laughs> maybe a few, a few insights that I believe God revealed to me. And we're going to have to discern if this is effectively what he is saying and pray through it. But at this point, this is what I believe uh, came from it. I've come to appreciate the power of prayer. I'm not a natural prayer. I'm very natural in reading. But praying is, is an effort for me. And God has been, spoken, has been speaking to me for years that I need to pray more. And the last few months I have done so. And I have seen the power that sits in repentant prayer, in intercessor prayer, intercessory prayer, and the prayer to invite God into your life, to partner with him. The prayer, praying is what ties power, people, and opportunities together. He spoke to me, I believe, that I should elevate my leadership qualities. He reminded me that leading is not about being the boss or going through a task list. It's about people, and it's about casting a vision. I believe he told me that I should aim to master leadership the God way, that I should specialize in that. Every new level of leadership is an opportunity to get better. He spoke, he spoke very clearly about my leadership through my kids. He pointed out specifically through my kids that I need to get better at empathy, that I need to be more flexible in my thinking, and that I need to be more welcoming, welcoming to people, making sure that they feel that they belong. In the end, he says, love is the greatest power, and you lead for the sake of others. If I'm not different, if I don't stand out, then the nations will never recognize God. He also encouraged me that I don't have to change the world overnight, but that I can just start with a few. If you just start with a few, it's already where you make an impact. He pointed out very precisely what my gifts are, um, my spiritual gifts. He told me which ones I'm using, which ones I'm not using right now. And he encourages me to practice those that I'm under underutilizing because he believes it's time that I start to operate in the fullness of my gifts. Yeah. Step out, practice, and you know, stand in faith, and the boldness will come. It's important to open the channel of the gifts, but also to be careful not to obstruct the channel by using my gifts when they are not necessary or where they are not necessary or to overcompensate with my gifts for those areas where I'm, for where I'm lacking. One of my gifts that I also don't have is implementation. I have a gift for administration, but I would say that the gift is more conceptual. 
I know what needs to get done, but I don't do very well myself. <laughs> so every, ta every time when I try to do it myself, I get in trouble, especially when working with a team at work. So when I try to step in and try to get things done myself, usually ends up being not so, it gets a bit of a mess. So God has asked me to please let him guide the implementation, to pray when things need to be implemented and to show me who can do it for me so I don't have to do it myself. And I have done so. And time and time again, things are so much easier. And he gets things, he gets things done his way and it, 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 it gets done perfectly. I was able to step out of my comfort zone a bit. So um, little by little, nothing huge, no people f coming to Christ or falling over, struck by the Holy Spirit, but <laughs> on a few occasions I've been able to bring God into the workplace. Um, I started also to pray with people where I can, when I can. I started to practice sharing a word with the congregation, and I was also able to start confiding certain personal things to people within the church that I cur currently also consider as being very good friends. I believe he reminded me that the mission field, the harvest, is just right around us. It's not far away. It's around us. It's a scary world out there. It's very, it's very different. It's very dark and it's very confused. But I think he told me that it's important that we don't close the door on those that are different and those even that have different beliefs than what I believe. Those people look, those people look threatening and they look very different, but they need God. They need direction. They look for things. They are lost but they look for things in the wrong places. If I close the door, if I don't engage, then the nations will never see God. Amen. One, one scripture he put on my heart a while ago is that the days are evil and the maximally opportune time is now. If, everybody, if, if anyone ever wants to discuss the Greek with me, please do so because it's amazing. Anyway, um, the opportune time is now. I believe I have always a missing puzzle piece in my hands for people to know what's missing in their life, and that missing puzzle piece is the gospel. He also encouraged me again on two fronts. Number one, he said you can be very strategic about opportunities. Opportunities can come your way, and when they do, I usually freeze. I don't know what to do. But he also said you can create opportunities, and you can control the opportunity, and make sure that it develops in the way that you're comfortable with. That's what I do at work all the time. I create opportunities for new ideas, new businesses, um, work with people, um, get things approved by senior management. He said, you can do the same when it comes to my work. Create an opportunity that you think will be um, uh, presented in a way that you're comfortable with. That was such a revelation, so comforting. He also encouraged me that although the world out there, most of them have forgotten about God, they do come from a background that wants new God. In the United States, most people come from a background that wants new God. So there is a generational precedent. There is a cultural precedent. When we have an authentic faith, when we have an authentic church, people will recognize it and will be able to identify with it. Amen. He also has shown me that the God of recognition and the God of ambition still operate in my life. But that the only father that I need to impress is my father who is in heaven, and that he loves me anyway. Get rid of my personal agenda, which is so liberating. It makes things so much easier. It's time to get out of the way and um, let God do things his way. Doing so impacts how I share the gospel, directly or, or indirectly, positively or negatively. Sophia talked about stripping. He has been very explicit through my wife that sanctification and growing in servanthood are a process and it's very often painful. He told me that I need to be stripped of the old self in order to become who he wants me to be. It's a process that involves action on my ends, but I also need to learn to rest in his promises and do it his way. It means getting out of the way myself and recognize that every new level, every new opportunity is a process which takes time and which takes stripping. Dreams are being revised, revived, I believe. Corrupt or jaded ambitions of the past that somehow you know, started with a, um, a personal agenda or that were not driven by, by, by good motives and that then over time died and got buried and are long forgotten, are long forgotten will be made pure again and they will be restored. I think God told me that my past experiences 
has prepared me for the future, for something, for something new, so the fullness of my life can be made manifest in the kingdom for the kingdom. The dreams that I once had of being successful and doing something in the pharmaceutical industry that is of significance and has impact has been restored in the last 40 days. There's a new passion, a new flame that lit up in me about what I can do, what I can do through my professional skills and my professional setting. And there may even be a promotion in the works. We'll see. I believe there is, but you know, God will tell. If it's his agenda, it will be done. He's been speaking very specifically and explicitly about what needs to be fixed at work. A few things need fixing. He has told me how I can contribute, and he has been very carefully orchestrating the pieces of the puzzle in the last few months. Things are starting to come together, and I'm very curious to see where it will lead us. It's exciting. It's going to be also a new level of learning, and again, probably a painful stripping process will come with it. I pray that all this comes to pass, that the insights effectively turn into a second nature, that it will be a lasting change, and that things will effectively never be the same. I pray this for me, for my family, for you, for our church, and for those around us. Amen. Amen.